Commutify presents Between the Lines with Andy Keaton. Each week, we explore the challenging issues transportation demand management professionals face on their journey to transition commuters from driving alone to more sustainable, shared and active commuting habits. Be sure to subscribe to hear next week's episode and check out our exclusive commuter playlists on Spotify. This is Between the Lines with Andy Keaton. Hi, everyone, and welcome aboard to this week's Between the Lines podcast. I'm Andy Keaton, and today we're joined by Andrew Salzberg, who's the head of policy at Transit, the largest public transportation app in North America. Uh, from 2019 to 2020, Andrew was a Loeb Fellow at Harvard, where he created the Decarbonizing Transportation Newsletter. And before that, he created and held a unique executive role at Uber, where he created the first teams focused on partnerships with public transportation agencies and environmental sustainability. And prior to all of that, he worked at the World Bank on Urban, uh, Urban and Transport Development in China. He teaches at MIT in Columbia, holds a Bachelor of Civil Engineering from McGill University here in Montreal, um, and a Master's in Urban Planning from Harvard. So I think it's safe to say we're pretty excited to have you on today, Andrew. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And today we're talking about a, an interesting concept, an interesting topic. We've talked a little bit in the past about kind of data. We're diving more into that again today. So we're talking about why transit data accessibility will help save the planet. And obviously you working at transit, data is you know, a big thing that you all do. Can you yeah. first tell us and those of us that don't know what transit is, what is transit um, and what do you do with data? Yeah, great. So like you said, transit is the biggest public transportation app in North America. So there are, you know, navigation apps like Google Maps are, are larger, but both Google and Apple, their primary use case is people driving. So transit is everything but driving. So if you open the app, depending where you are, you're definitely going to see public transportation directions, but you might also find uh, your local bike share system, on-demand scooters, car share, ride hail, kind of every way you can imagine to get around that's not your own car. That's what transit is if you open it up as a product. Uh, across North America, increasingly in Europe and Latin America as well. So we help you find the best way to get from A to B, no matter what it is, as long as it's not driving yourself. Nice. And when it comes to data, just to answer your data question, I mean, start diving in that. I mean, we, we consume, as you might imagine, to get that stuff into your hands, we have to consume data from all those different operators. So that might be your public transportation provider in your local area. It might be the bike share company that operates bike share on your corner. It could be a car share operator. It's a whole wide variety of different services that we have to interact with to make that bundle of options available in a way that actually works for people. So that's a pretty complicated thing. You can imagine, right? How are you getting data in a way that you can use it and consume it and provide it to someone conveniently in cities all across the world from dozens of different operators and hundreds of different transit agencies? That's kind of the core of the work that happens within transit. Yeah, I think that like it gets into this a whole idea and, and some of our listeners may know of the, you know, the terms GTFS, GBFS, yes. you know, general transit feed specification and biking. I think there's now like thoughts of the G like oh. OFS yeah. or something similar. Can sure. you talk a little bit about that okay. and how, yeah. What is, what is all this stuff? What are these acronyms? How do that, how does that help? They, yeah. They roll off the tongue first of all, right? I and mean, what's more catchy <laughs> than GTFS and GBFS? Right? No one knows how to pronounce them or what they are. Yeah, so GTFS is the oldest one, and it, uh, it the G was originally for Google, the Google Transit Feed specification, but now it's broadened beyond Google. Uh, and it first started in Portland with TriMet, you know, one of the kind of most forward looking yep. agencies we got in North America, which were looking at Google Maps, which was, you know, this is 2005, so still relatively new and kind of getting more and more adopted and seeing lots of driving directions, but no transit directions. And so the, the dream has been, well, how can transit agencies share information so that people, navigation apps like Transit App can actually consume it and show it to you. And that, that sounds simple. We kind of take it for granted that you can find that information, but it really wasn't. Uh, and not just because of the data standards. So GTFS has really helped because now if you're a small transit agency anywhere in the world, you can publish your schedule information, meaning you know where are the stops, when does the bus come, where do they go, what are the routes in ways that's easy to consume. Uh, but also consumers can you know, take that on without having to build any new code, essentially, to make that possible. That's been great. Um, but, you know, it also took a bit of political will for transit agencies to actually want to share that information. We think now that's obvious. But if you go back yeah. even 10 years ago, the New York MTA, there's a headline, they were suing app developers who were trying to use their data to make 
schedule information available for people because you know they wanted to yeah. build the app and they didn't want to be competing with somebody else. So it's partly like technical standards have made the data sharing possible, but also I think people have decided, generally speaking, that it's good from a transit agency perspective to make that freely available and then have a whole bunch of apps, whether it's transit or Google or somebody else, kind of consume that and make it available. So yeah, data standards and I think just you know changes in how people think about what data should be accessible and free over the last 15 years have really changed things a lot. And so I would say on the public transport side, uh, it's kind of standard policy now that you want to make that data available freely without really restrictive licenses in standard formats available widely as widely as you can. And not just schedule, but now we have real-time information, obviously, in a lot of places. Um, and now, like you mentioned, the question is, you know, we said at the beginning, we're not just transit information, right? We're also bikes yep. and scooters and everything else. So there's, you know, GBFS is about six years old as a data standard and very much yeah. modeled on GTFS. Works originally for dock bike share, then for dockless bike share, scooters. That's pretty widely adopted, but it's far from universal. I think much less universal than the transit side. And then, like you said, for things like on-demand, taxis, ride hail, microtransit, that stuff, we're working right now with a whole group of people within Mobility Data, which is a nonprofit based in Montreal, where we're both sitting, uh, to try and, try and build those data standards for some of the services that don't exist. So there's a lot of places that's gone really well. I think public transport's an obvious case where data is really widely available. Um, bike share and scooters, pretty good, but not great in lots of places to improve. And then more on-demand rides, kind of not even a data standard and not a ton of transparency on the data there. And I think like, I, I was reading something on your website that kind of maybe put this in perspective and in, in a way people can think about it. You have something like a messaging app where like, yeah. if I go on Facebook Messenger, I can't message someone on, yes. I don't know, a WhatsApp or something. Maybe yeah. I can because they're owned by the same company, yeah. but <laughs> bad example. Yeah. But um, something like email, I can use Gmail. Someone can else can use Yahoo yeah. or Outlook and we can email each other. That's the idea, right? Like it doesn't yeah. matter what your you know, back end technology is or front end technology, they're all going to speak to each other. That's the idea. I mean, I think, it's funny, you know, I think mostly people talk about email to complain about email, <laughs> but in practice, it's kind of amazing. We don't notice how well it works. Like you just mentioned, if I have a Gmail account and I email your corporate account or somebody's, you know, university account, those just connect to each other. And that's so boring. It's not even worth mentioning most of the time, but it's really not yeah. how most of the new technology platforms like, you know, Messenger in the case of Facebook or other, you know, similar messaging apps, they want to be you know, communicating amongst the people within the network, but not more widely. And part of the reason for that is obviously if you're building that service, you want people to come in there and be stuck and see all their friends are in there and kind of join that network. We probably don't want, if we have the choice, our mobility system to work like that, where you have to be in one particular system to have access to all the modes of transportation in your city, Or right? Ideally, people would be able to find the services in whatever way it works for them, wherever they want to book it, however they want to book it. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons that's good for you as a consumer, but probably also good. You know, I think the premise of the podcast is, you know, how are we making things better for people in a lot of ways? And at the systems level, I think there's a lot of reasons to be more excited about a mobility system as things go more and more digital, more online, that looks like the flexible system that email has built and not like what Messenger has. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, email is that way, not because of random chance, but because literally... I think it's 50 years ago now in the early 70s, there were data standards built out for how message exchange should happen by email. And obviously there's a lot more people emailing now than there were 50 years ago, but the standard is still there. And so that basic idea of how does the message get sent from one account to another kind of helped underpin that. And that's where we think the kind of unwieldy acronyms like GTFS and GBFS <laughs> we were just talking about, those can be the kind of building blocks for the email system we're hoping to have for mobility in the future. All right. And Obviously, to the you know to the transit rider, to the user of the system, they don't need to even know that GTFS exists because yeah. you at Transit, elsewhere, other apps yeah. are creating this easy to use system. So let's actually dive into that. What is it that a user sees when they go on Transit? Like what yeah. what are you doing with data to make it easier for you know users yeah. to actually work with it? Yes, yeah. I mean the main thing you see when you open the app is you know the bus stop next to you, like when is the next bus arriving? That's the primary use case is people who are opening it up to get real-time information on where they're gonna go or what their next arrival time for the bus or Metro or whatever system they use. That's you know the bread and butter of transit. That's what it started with. But increasingly you're also seeing, you know, ways to plan a trip across town. So not just to know when the bus on the corner arrives, but to say, okay, I'm going from here to here and what's the best combination of modes I can use to get there. So more trip planning 
uh, as we've gone further along. And then obviously beyond just transit, which tends to be ranked right at the top of the results when you open the app, you're seeing things like I would here when I open it in Montreal, uh, I see Bixi, our local bike share system right in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might also find on-demand rides from different providers as well. So yeah, trip planning, uh, schedule information, real-time data on where you are, where you want to go. And then, you know, the next frontier we haven't talked about as much uh, is how do you actually pay for your ride or how do you unlock your bike? Yeah. Right? All the data standards we've been talking about are either schedule or real-time information, but, you know, GTFS data from a transit agency doesn't let you actually pay for your ticket. And that's been a much more complicated problem to solve and a more complex, uh, you know, solution to build. And there are not really data standards to speak of, widely speaking, to, to do that. So for the case of in Bixi, Montreal, you know, that's one of the places where I actually use transit to unlock the bike itself. And I can do that without leaving the app and it gives me the code, I can punch it in, hop on a bike. And so we have, that's happening in more places. You can buy your ticket in the app for, you know, dozens of transit agencies, et cetera. But that's still much more limited than the sort of information finding. So we'd love to build more of that. And there are a lot of obstacles, both technical and otherwise to doing that. So there is some payment and unlocking, but a lot of it is finding your next bus or finding your route across town and using whatever combination of modes makes sense. I mean, I'm obviously very excited about the idea of being able to have one app to pay for, book, do everything, right? Yeah. Like that sounds great. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, while, you know, you all are working to get there and I can understand that the, maybe the political, uh, you know, issues at, at hand sure. maybe are bigger than the technical ones, not sure, but um, just having the data itself seems to be particularly valuable. Yeah. So how does having this data, like right in the palm of someone's hand, how does this help someone, you know, ditch their car? That's what you're yeah. talking about. You can do everything except driving. So how does yeah. this actually help you do that? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we are in a competition, the we being, you know, everything that's not the car with yeah. people hanging over and using a car, right? I think uh, different people have referred to the mix of, you know, car share, bike share, transit as the rebel alliance and owning your own car as the empire, right? So it's a scrappy band of people who in a lot of places, in North American context, you know, Montreal is one of the better places for transit ridership, but it's still a minority most places outside of the, of the core of most cities. So we're trying to grow that mix. And I think to do that, you know, people ultimately make choices that are most convenient for them. And if you have a car parked in your driveway, you know where it is, you have a sense of how long it takes to get across town, you don't have any kind of uncertainty of whether it's going to deliver you where you're going. So it's a pretty convenient product. We all know, I think if you listen to this podcast or you are a transit user, you know about some of the reasons that car use is not so great from a city design perspective and a whole bunch of other reasons, but we shouldn't delude ourselves that it's not pretty convenient and reliable for those people who are yep. used to doing it. So if you want to get somebody off that behavior, you have to offer them something pretty good. And if you want to do that, you know, it really helps to be able to combine different modes. You know, I will occasionally take a bike to a transit stop to save myself a transfer and save myself a long walk. And because the data for the bike share system and the transit system are publicly available, you know, transit can suggest that kind of thing. And having really reliable real-time information to me, you know, is a game changer just psychologically for taking something like a bus in particular. Now, I'm old enough to mm -hmm. know when there were bus schedules that were like printed on the bus stop <laughs> and like maybe they were reliable, but you know, you couldn't tell and you're always like craning your neck to see if the bus was coming. Yeah. And being able to watch it come on an app is a pretty important feature. Um, and I think particularly for transit agencies to have that same level of service digitally that some of the newer modes, you know, I used to work at Uber, as you mentioned, obviously Uber has a pretty slick way to get you a car. So how do we make sure that transit services can kind of compete with what people have grown to expect from understanding where the service is, how long it's going to take, et cetera. So I think it's really important to have data be not just publicly available, but high quality and reliable for all the modes that are not your own car. So we actually have a hope of kind of beating the car on convenience uh, and a few other measures so we can actually get people to you know, change their behavior in more places. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it makes, it makes sense to me. I think I've seen a study, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but there was something saying like waiting for a bus is, you know, like people overestimate that time by yeah. like three X because it's yeah. so awful. And you're like, it was supposed to be here five minutes ago. Yeah. And it's like five minutes, but it feels yeah. like 15. And it's like, I'm never taking the bus again. So yeah. I love this idea. Like you can walk out the door and actually know when you're going to get yeah. there uh, and, and not have to wait. It says, I mean, it, if you look in travel models where people try and predict people's behavior, what you said is true, right? People, people will throw in a wait time 
there's a it, it feels like twice as long or three times as long depending on the study when you're waiting for something and i think it feels yeah. even particularly worse if you're waiting longer than you expected or you don't know how long to expect so if we can bring that down you know it can make the overall ride seem like a more convenient alternative yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah. so Okay, so this is great. So we now have this this app in our pocket that allows us to know when the train's coming yeah. or when the bus is coming. More particularly, um, you know, what other options are out there? Uh, what are the you know? So what are the benefits then to yeah. this? Uh, what is the impact on society? The you know the greater whole outside of the individual. What do we see from you know places where transit is being used a lot? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think the thing is obviously the the, the big benefit we're hoping for is more people to use more modes that are public transport or other you know combinations of those things uh, i yeah. think the truth is that people are choosing to take a particular trip partially because there's data available on it and they can find it but i think probably more fundamentally to be honest and i'm saying this even though i work at a tech company is the quality <laughs> of service that's underlying that right you know it's one thing sure. to know that your bus only comes every 45 minutes but that's not as good as a bus that comes every five minutes so i think you know, the majority of what drives people's decision making is genuinely the quality of service and what's available. And then the layer on top that can really work well with that is the kind of stuff that we're doing to make it understandable and easy to use. So, you know, the impact we're hoping for is ultimately more behavior that gets people out of their cars. And the reason that's exciting is, you know, probably familiar to people who are listening to this, but, you know, particularly in the context of climate change, there is, you know, it transportation in the, in the U.S. is the largest source of emissions and the largest piece of that is driving your own car. Uh, so if you can get people out of cars, that's great. Obviously, there's a lot of move towards electric cars, which I'm excited about, but electric cars still have to be produced and they have to be powered by something, all of which takes quite a lot of energy, even if it's renewable. So really, if you could stop driving or stop using your car, the benefits to that are really huge. Uh, doesn't mean that everybody can do it, but I think if we can make it more compelling to more people, that's going to be positive. So that that's the big picture, right? How does data help the services that are not your car become more compelling. To give you some specific examples of where I think data can play a really big role. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think some of, the, some of the newer modes that are on demand, you can have more impact there from a digital service. So, you know, for example, we're working with some uh, smaller suburban jurisdictions that are doing things like on-demand transit or micro transit you might've heard of. So, you know, smaller vehicles that aren't 40 foot long buses uh, and that kind of service, people have been toying with that idea, and it exists in a lot of forms for a long time. But during COVID, there was kind of more cities that were embarking on the idea of saying, well, we're not going to run a fixed bus every so often. We're going to have a zone where you can request a ride and we'll send you a van or something like that. And one of the challenges for those services has been people knowing about them and knowing how to use them. And that's the kind of place where having it available in transit app when you open that up and understanding how it works and how those micro transit services connect to the broader system. That's a place where I think something like our service can really have an impact. So we launched uh, in Durham, Ontario, uh, up here in Canada. Uh, we got uh, one out of 10 people who are using the new microtransit service, we're finding it through transit. So there's some pretty you know, significant size impact of people discovering a new service, particularly when it's newer, when schedules have changed, when things are on demand. You know, If you have to just walk to your subway and you do the same thing every day, then maybe changing behavior is not going to be that important from a service like ours, although the reliability of seeing the data is. But for newer stuff on demand, there's some good data we're seeing uh, people actually being able to find that more easily than before. That's that's really interesting. So yeah. I hadn't necessarily thought about this from a on-demand transit kind yeah. of system, but it obviously makes a lot of sense. Obviously, yeah. you need the data behind it to, to make it work well. Yeah. Um, and really what you're saying is like, Here's this suite of solutions, the TDM, Transportation Demand Management Solutions. Yep. And we talk about this every week in the podcast. We'll, mm -hmm. you know, hone in on a single one. We'll say yep. like, this is the one that, you know, here's one solution that could work. Here's another solution that could work. And this is this over, you know, overlaying layer um, that says you need this for all of them to work. Yep. Um, so yep. if we want people out of their cars, we need to provide a good sense of how these these systems work and that is coming cool. from data yeah and that's i think i think that's the thing too people say well you know if the data is available you know what's transit app doing and i think the question is you know you can imagine you just listed there's a whole lot of different ways you can get around so how are you making that information kind of easy to use compelling available and not just overwhelming people by dumping every piece of data on them about all the services yep. in the city <laughs> at the same time so we you know i think there's a definitely a precursor to having good data available that's accurate high quality real time and you know, decent service that underlies that data that you have something that people really want to use, but then combining that into 
something you can open up on your phone and really find something simply without being overwhelmed by it is, is kind of the core of what we're up to. I love it. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I remember this was years ago. Uh, my fiance was, uh, she's like, we were waiting for a bus. I think it was in Boulder. Um, and she pulls out her phone and I pull out mine and I'm like, I have no idea when this bus is coming. And she like pulls up this app I've never heard of. This is like before I was doing anything in transportation. Yeah. And she's like, oh, this is really cool. It shows when the bus is coming. And I was like, no way. That's so weird. It turns out it was transit. And it was like, it was, it was very cool. I, it, it worked well. And then we we're like, okay, we can take the bus now, even when it's snowing. Like we don't have to yeah. wait, you know, at right. a stop for five minutes. It makes perfect sense. And it makes sense that it can also now go beyond just, yeah. you right. know, a fixed route bus, whether it's on demand, public transit or something else. Definitely. This is great. And you've talked a little bit about where you see kind of the future of this going. You talked a little about payments, things like that, but yeah. let's, let's just kind of concretely ask this question. Where do you see the future of data accessibility going? Um, and, and what do we need to do? You know, in your opinion, maybe we're not going in a direction you think we should be going. What do we need to be doing that we're, that we're not doing? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think we just we just put out a long. If people really want to go into the details on this, we put out a guide <laughs> called the the Transit Guide to Open Mobility as a Service. So, mobility as a service is this idea that I would say is, let's call it slightly overhyped. I think it's been yeah. in the past. You know, that, <laughs> that despite the fact that I work at a company that's building, I think one of the most concrete examples of it. There's been a lot over the last five six years. People have said, you know, mobility as a service. Basically, the idea that you don't have to own your mobility device, your car. You can rely on it and just get the rides you need. And that'll be better for a lot of reasons, which I agree with. Um, and there's even ideas of saying, well, you know, you'll be able to pay a subscription fee that will give you access to all kinds of different modes. So you might sure. pay hundred bucks a month and you get not just a transit pass, but a transit plus other stuff pass. Sounds um, great. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. I think there's a lot of reasons to be excited about that. But I think if you want to get to a world where it's really seamlessly that you can book every mode of transport uh, whenever you need it, maybe even bundle some of those up and pay for them. Uh, in a subscription, if that's useful for you, I think to get there, if that's the vision we're hoping for, I think we need a few more things. We need we need to finish out some of the the data standards we talked about all the way at the very beginning that aren't fully adopted. Even just finding the information for things like on demand, taxi, ride hail, etc. That's not always mm -hmm. standardized or easy to find. But then, to your point, I think payments the other real big piece. So right now, it can be a bit of a hassle to actually pay for a ride. In the case of public transport agencies, a lot of times. You can't buy a mobile ticket, or if you can, you have to download a special app each city you're in to be able to access that. Uh, and that app might not have trip planning. So you have to kind of like toggle various things if you're able to. Uh, and certainly for bike share, scooters, ride hail, you know, at the, at the best case scenario, you can be linked to another app, but in a lot of cases, it's just really hard to find and pay for. So I think more openness there would allow, I think, a level of integration that we haven't seen yet. Um, and as more things are available on demand, including public transportation, I think that kind of integration gets more important. And we don't want to end up in a situation where all these services are walled off from one another. So, you know, our vision is that they're easy to integrate, they're easy to operate, they're easy to pay for. Doesn't mean you have to use all of them, but that they're all available that you can use kind of when it makes the most sense for you. So to get there, I think we need, you know, data standards, very boring, unsexy, but important data standards. <laughs> uh, I think we need the, the willingness of public agencies to kind of push for some of the openness we're looking for. And then I think we need companies to build on top of that and kind of deliver these things to people like transit stand. So to, to put you on the spot really quickly, do you think this is something we have in five years, 10 years? Like, is there a time horizon or no. is it just, hopefully at some point we'll get it? <laughs> I mean, I think there, there are places you can point to that have different versions of it already. You know, like uh, you know, here in Montreal over the summer, I could unlock a bike without leaving transit and I could buy a bus ticket. Uh, I couldn't buy a metro ticket for a bunch of reasons that have to do, you know, how the tickets are validated and things like that. But there are places where information is almost uni universally available and you can pay for a ride in a bunch of different places. Now, I think it's not universal even in Montreal and there's yeah. work to do here. Um, but, you know, it, the, the line that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet, I think is true about this stuff. There are places, you know, Denver is a good example. You can buy a Denver RTD ticket from the transit agency in transit app, but also yeah. Uber and in Lyft and a few other places that that ability to connect to transit systems is getting better in a lot of locations. Um, there's another layer too of how do we, now that those prices and tickets are more available, how do you make sure people are being offered incentives to maybe reduce congestion or maybe help people make a choice that's more sustainable? That's like, you know, one level even beyond 
uh, just being able to pay for things. But I would say, you know, mobility as a service is here in some isolated examples, but we got a long way to go to make that super seamless and then start to see if we can deliver some of the results we want to see in terms of behavior change and, and you know, different mode adoption. That's going to take a little while, but the technical foundations exist, but not that widely adopted yet. So we're, you know, we're, we're getting there. We'll be there soon. It's just it's uh, getting that collaboration, you know, it's yeah. how it always comes down to it. And it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah. Okay. We're, you know, running short on time here. So we yeah. come down to our last question. <laughs> uh, and we ask this every week to every, yeah. every guest, um, let us know in a few sentences, why will transit data accessibility help save the planet? Got it. Well, if you look in the United States, car and light truck emissions, uh, one third of the global total for those emissions are in the United States, and it's the single largest source of emissions. So if we can get people to change behavior onto anything but the car, you get huge benefits. And if we're going to do that, we need all those modes to be accessible, easily available, and data standards are what makes that competition possible. I love it. Succinct, perfect. <laughs> uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. Uh, everyone who's listening and or watching, uh, thank you for being here again this week. Make sure you subscribe to our uh, podcast, wherever it is that you listen to it, um, as well as on YouTube and, and take a look, uh, you know, whenever you're in the office and looking for something to watch and look like you're productive, this is a great thing. You actually are being productive because you're learning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if, uh, if you want to actually dive more deeply into any of these conversations, we send out a newsletter every week. You can subscribe to that at betweenthelines.io. Um, we'll certainly be sending out this guide for open open data yeah, standards yeah. like you that you've put together. Um, yeah. It's 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 dense. I like it. It's it's a lot. It's it's a good place. Good thing to dive into um, <laughs> over many may, maybe many sittings. Um, really thorough. Like it a lot. So find us at betweenthelines.io, um, and we'll see you all again next week. Andrew, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. Perfect. See you, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Between the Lines with Andy Keaton. Be sure to subscribe to hear next week's episode and check out our exclusive commuter playlists on Spotify.